Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones you can't solve right now, and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. So what exactly is Sleepy Darm Tales? What is it for? What is this strange thing, this strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? 21st century is a time of struggle and sleep is a health crisis. And this is a podcast intending to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night? Mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes background noise or company. That's why I make these episodes quite long so that I'm here for you without any pressure of the end coming. Now as far as I know there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The primary idea behind Sleepy Time Tales is that it gives you something to focus on. A story that lets you keep your mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stresses and anxieties. To give you just enough focus not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep. But maybe you need something a bit different. Maybe you just need some kind of background. Some people like white noise. Some people like the rain or the wind in the trees or the sound of the ocean. Or maybe what works for you is just some boring dude droning on in the background. But just lie back and listen and keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now, obviously I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode. But it's important you don't feel pressurized. Because this will probably actually not work on your first night. I recommend giving it a solid three nights try to see if you can adjust to it. Get used to the strangeness of the idea and listening to my voice. and Maybe my accent, which is a bit strange to some people. And also, especially early on, maybe one episode isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't even going to sleep. Maybe you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend, because it's what works for me and works for others, is to let the podcast run all night. Download a whole bunch of episodes, put them into a playlist, and when you go to bed, start them up and let them go. That way, you wake up at 3am, the podcast's still on, you can carry on listening and just go straight back to sleep again. You can even do the same thing if you wake up before your alarm, 60 minutes or 30 minutes before the alarm goes. And you may wonder what the point is. What good is an extra 30 minutes or 60 minutes of sleep? But I've actually had people email in and thank me for suggesting that you carry on trying. Because there is something about allowing complete relaxation right before the alarm that's satisfying on a whole new level. So relax into this. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this will seem strange to you, so give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, Except maybe in a dream. 
Before we get on with the show, I'd like to take a couple of minutes of your time. As regular listeners know, I left my job a few months ago to go full-time into podcast editing and production. So if you or someone you know would like to start a podcast, or has one but are struggling to get everything done, I can take over most of the editing and admin for you, including taking control of your full launch which is a process full of annoying little tasks that take ages if you don't know exactly what you're doing. So if you'd like a little bit of help and uh, some more free time, feel free to get in touch with my email in the episode notes for a free consultation, and I'll get you going in the right direction. And we can see how I can take the pressure off you so that you can focus on the fun stuff, or spend more time doing more interesting things than audio editing and podcast admin. And if you'd like to support Sleepy Time Tales to help me keep it ad-free and going out to thousands of insomniacs just like you, please consider supporting it on Patreon at patreon.com sleepytimetales. This is monthly support that not only helps me keep the lights on, but can get you fun bonuses based on your contribution level. From $2 a month, you get um, early access to the main episodes, and $5 a month gets you weekly bonus minisodes and special edits of the main show and a monthly megasode, which is all the month's releases in one big listen. And if monthly support seems like a big ask, you can make once off tips through the tip jar on the website, which you can go to from the link in the show notes. And I've also got some merchandise and other cool stuff up on Tee Public. A lot of it isn't even Sleepy Time Tales um, branded. So you can support the podcast and support me without having to explain to people what a Sleepy Time Tales is and why you're wearing a shirt with it on it. And another huge way to help the show is just to spread the word. If you do know someone who struggles to sleep, just tell them about Sleepy Time Tales and see if that works out for them. Spreading the word will help me and to help us to do our small parts in helping people improve their lives. And last but not least, of course, I've got to shout out the music, which is Sweet Mountain Friends by Kumiko. Their stuff is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. Thanks for taking the time. Let's get back to the show. And we return for our second week of Halloween to the Book of Halloween by Ruth Edna Kelly. Cabbages are important in Scotch superstition. Children believe that if they pile cabbage stalks round the doors and windows of the house, the fairies will bring them a new brother or sister. Kale pulling came first on the program in Burns' Halloween. Just the single and unengaged went out hand in hand, blindfolded, to the cabbage garden. They pulled the first stalk they came upon, brought it back to the house and were unbandaged. The size and shape of the stalk indicated the appearance of the future husband or wife. A close white head meant an old husband, an open green head a young one. His disposition would be like the taste of the stem. To determine his name, the stalks were hung over the door, and the number of one stalk in the row noted. If Jessie put hers up third from the beginning, and the third man who passed through the doorway under it was named Alan, her husband's first name would be Alan. This is practiced only a little now among farmers, and a special virtue if the cabbage has been stolen from the garden of an unmarried person. Sometimes the pith of a cabbage stalk was pushed out, the hole filled with tow which was set afire and blown through the keyholes on Halloween. Cabbage broth was a regular dish at Halloween feast. Mashed potatoes as an island or a dish of meal and milk hold symbolic objects. A ring, a thimble and a coin. In the cake are baked a ring and a key. The ring signifies to the possessor marriage and the key a journey. Apple ducking is still a universal custom in Scotland. A sixpence is sometimes dropped into the tub 
or stuck into an apple to make the reward greater. The contestants must keep their hands behind their backs. Nuts are put up before the fire in pairs, instead of by threes as in Ireland, and named for a lover and his lass. If they burn to ashes together, long happy married life is destined for the lovers. If they crackle or start away from each other, dissension and separation are ahead. Three luckies, bowls with handles like the druid lamps, were filled. One with clean, one with dirty water, and one left empty. The person wishing to know his fate in marriage was blindfolded, turned about thrice, and put down his left hand. If he dipped it into the clean water, he would marry a maiden. If into the dirty, a widow. If into the empty dish, not at all. He tried until he got the same result twice. The dishes were changed about each time. This spell still remains, as does that of hemp seed sowing. One goes out alone with a handful of hemp seed, sows it across ridges of ploughed land, and harrows it with anything convenient, perhaps with a broom. Having said, Hemp seed, I saw thee, and her that is to be my lass, come after me and draw thee. He looks behind him to see his sweetheart gathering hemp. They should be gathered just at midnight with the moon behind. A spell that has been discontinued is throwing the clue of a blue yarn into the kiln pot, instead of out the window, as in Ireland. As it is wound backwards, something holds it. The winder must ask, who holds, to hear the name of her future sweetheart. Another spell not commonly tried now is winnowing three measures of imaginary corn. As one stands in the barn alone, with both doors open, to let the spirits that come in go out again freely. As one finishes the motions, the apparition of the future husband will come in at one door and pass out at the other. At other times, prophetic appearances were seen. Formerly a stack of beans, oats or barley was measured round with the arms against sun. At the end of the third time the arms would enclose the vision of the future husband or wife. Kale pulling, apple snapping and lead melting, sea island, are social rites. But many were to be tried alone and in secret. A highland divination was tried with a shoe held by the tip and thrown over the house. The person will journey in the direction the toe points out. If it falls soul up, it means bad luck. Girls would pull a straw out of a thatch in broad sea and would take it to an old woman in Fraserburg. The seeress would break the straw and find within it a hair the color of the lovers to be. Blindfolded, they plucked heads of oats and counted the number of grains to find out how many children they would have. If the tip was perfect, not broken or gone, they would be married honorably. Another way of determining the number of children was to drop the white of an egg into a glass of water. The number of divisions was the number sought. White of egg is held with water in the mouth like the grains of oats in Ireland, or one takes a walk to hear mentioned the name of his future wife. Names are written on papers and laid out upon the chimney piece. Fate guards the hand of a blindfolded man to the slip which bears his sweetheart's name. A Halloween mirror is made by the rays of the moon, shining into a looking glass. If a girl goes secretly into a room at midnight between October and November, sits down at the mirror and cuts an apple into nine slices, holding each on the point of a knife before she eats it, she may see in the moonlit glass the image of her lover looking over her left shoulder 
and asking for the last piece of apple. The wetting of the sock sleeve in a south running bone where three lads lands meet, and carrying it home to dry before the fire, was really a Scotch custom, but has already been described in Ireland. Just before breaking up, the crowd of young people partook of sowens, oatmeal porridge, cakes with butter and strunt, a liquor, as they hoped for good luck throughout the year. The Hebrides, Scottish islands off the west coast, have Halloween traditions of their own, as well as many borrowed from Ireland and Scotland. Barra, isolated near the end of the island chain, still celebrates the Celtic days, Beltane and November Eve. In the Hebrides is the Irish custom of eating on Halloween a cake of meal and salt, or a salt herring, bones and all, to dream of someone bringing a drink of water. Not a word must be spoken, nor a drop of water drunk till the dream comes. In St Kilda a large triangular cake is baked which must be eaten all up before morning. A curious custom that prevailed in the island of Lewis in the 18th century was the worship of Shoni, a sea god with a Norse name. The ceremonies were similar to those paid to summon in Ireland, but more picturesque. Ale was brewed at church from malt brought collectively by the people. One took a cupful in his hand and waded out into the sea up to his waist, saying as he poured it out, Shoni, I give you this cup of ale, hoping that you'll be so kind as to send us plenty of seaway, for enriching our ground the ensuring year. The party returned to the church, waited for a given signal, when a candle burning on the altar was blown out. Then they went out into the fields and drank ale with dance and song. The dumb cake originated in Lewis. Girls were each apportioned a small piece of dough, mixed with any but spring water. They kneaded it with their left thumbs in silence. Before midnight they pricked initials on them with a new pin, and put them by the fire to bake. The girls withdraw to the farther end of the room, still in silence. At midnight, each lover was expected to enter and lay his hand on the cake marked with his initials. In South Eastern Mariske, on the Halloween, fairies are out, a source of terror to those who meet. But for the most part, this belief has died out on Scottish land, except near the border, and Halloween is celebrated only by stories and jokes and games, songs and dances. Chapter 9. In England and Man Man especially has a treasury of fairy tradition, Celtic and Norse combined. Manx fairies too dwell in the middle world, since they are fit for neither heaven nor hell. Even now, Manx people think they see circles of light in the late October midnight, and little folk dancing within. Longest of all in man was Samhain, considered New Year's Day. According to the old style of reckoning, it came on November 12th. As in Scotland, the servant's year ends with October. New Year tests for finding out the future were tried on Samhain. To hear her sweetheart's name, a girl took a mouthful of water and two handfuls of salt and sat down at a door. The first name she heard mentioned was the wished-for one. The three dishes proclaimed the fate of the blindfolded seeker, as in Scotland. Each was blindfolded and touched one of several significant objects. Meal for prosperity, earth for death, 
a net for tangled fortunes. Before retiring, each filled a thimble with salt, and emptied it out in a little mound on a plate, remembering his own. If any heap were found fallen over by morning, the person it represented was destined to die in a year. The Manx looked for prints in the smooth-strewn ashes on the hearth as the Scots did, and gave the same interpretation. There had been Christian churches in Britain as early as 300 AD, and Christian missionaries, St. Ninian, Pelagius, and St. Patrick, were active in the next century, and in the course of time St. Augustine. Still the old superstitions persisted, as they always do when they have grown up with people. King Arthur, who was believed to have reigned in the 5th century, may be a personification of the sun god. He comes from the other world. His magic sword Excalibur is brought thence to him. He fights twelve battles in number like the months and is wounded to death by evil Mordred, once his own knight. He passes in a boat attended by his fairy sister and two other queens. To the island valley of Avalion, where falls not hail nor rain nor any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly but it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns, and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea. Tennyson, Passing of Arthur The hope of being held there is like that given to Cuchlain, to persuade him to visit the fairy kingdom. Arthur was expected to come again sometime as the sun renews his course. As he disappeared from the sight of Bedivere, the last of his nights, the new sun rose, bringing the new year. Avilion means Apple Island. It was like the Hesperides of Greek mythology, the western islands where grew the golden apples of immortality. In Cornwall, after the 6th century, the sun god became St. Michael, and the eastern point where he disappeared, St. Michael's seat. As fruit to Pomona, so berries were devoted to fairies. They would not let anyone cut a blackthorn shoot on Halloween. In Cornwall, sloes and blackberries were considered unfit to eat after the fairies had passed by, because all the goodness was extracted. So they were eaten to heart's content on October 31st and avoided thereafter. Hazels, because they were thought to contain wisdom and knowledge, were also sacred. Besides leaving berries for the little people, food was set out for them on Halloween and on other occasions. They rewarded this hospitality by doing an extraordinary amount of work. Such sprites did not scruple to pull away the chair as one was about to sit down, to pinch or even to steal children and leave changelings in their places. The first hint of dawn drove them back to their haunts. Soulless and without gratitude or memory, spirits of the air may be, like Ariel in the Tempest. He, like the fairy harpers of Ireland, puts men to sleep with his music. The people of England, in common with the lows who lived in the other countries of Great Britain and Europe, dreaded the coming of winter not only on account of the cold and loneliness, but because they believed that at this time the powers of evil were abroad and ascendant. This belief harked back to the old idea that the sun had been vanquished by his enemies in the late autumn. It was to forget the fearful influences about them that the English kept festivals so much in winter time. The lords of Misrule, leaders of the revelry, beginning their rule on Hall Allo Eve, continued the same till the morrow, after the Feast of the Purification, commonly called Candlemas Day, in all of which space there were fine and subtle disguisings, masks and mummeries. 
This was written of King Henry the Fosse Court at Eltham in 1401, and is true of centuries before and after. They gathered about the fire and made merry while the October tempests whirled the leaves outside and shrieked around the house like ghosts and demons on a mad carousel. Witchcraft, the origin of which will be traced further on, had a strong following in England. The three witches in Macbeth are really fates who foretell the future, but they have a kettle in which they boil, fillet of fenny snake, eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing, or a charm of powerful trouble. They connect themselves thereby with those evil creatures who pursued Tam and were servants of the devil. In 1892 in Lincolnshire, people believed that if they looked in through the church door on Halloween, they would see the devil preaching his doctrines from the pulpit and inscribing the names of new witches in his book. The Spectre Huntsman, known in Windsor Forest as Hearn the Hunter, and in Todd Morden as Gabriel Ratchets, was the spirit of an ungodly hunter, before his crimes was condemned to lead the chase till the judgment day. In a storm on Halloween has heard the belling of his hounds. Still, still shall last the dreadful chase, till time itself shall have no end. By day they scour earth's cavern space, at midnight's witching hour ascend. This is the horn, the hound and horse, that oft the gated peasant hears. Appall these signs the frequent cross, when the wild din invades his ears. In the north of England, Halloween was called Nutcrack and Snapapple Nut. It was celebrated by young people and sweethearts. A variation of the nut test is naming two for two lovers before they are put before the fire to roast. The unfaithful lover's nut cracks and jumps away. The loyal burns with a steady, ardent flame to ashes. If they jump toward each other, there will be rivals. If one of the nuts has been named for the girl and burns quietly with the lover's nut, they will live happily together. If they are restless, there is trouble ahead. Sometimes peas on a hot shovel are used instead. Down the centuries from the Druid, tree worship comes the spell of the walnut tree. It is circled thrice with the invocation, Let her that is to be my true love bring me some walnuts. And directly a spirit will be seen in the tree gathering nuts. The seeds of apples were used in many trials. Two stuck on cheeks or eyelids indicated by the time they clung the faithfulness of the friends named for them. In a tub float stemless apples, to be seized by the teeth of him desirous of having his love returned. If he is successful in bringing up the apple, his love affair will end happily. An apple is peeled all in one piece and the pairing swung three times round the head and dropped behind the left shoulder. If it does not break and is looked at over the shoulder, it forms the initial of the true sweetheart's name. In the north of England was a unique custom, the scattering of peas. A pea pod was slit, a bean pushed inside and the opening closed again. The full pods were boiled in a portion to be shelled, and the peas eaten with butter and salt. The one finding the bean on his plate would be married first. Gay records another taste with peas, which is like the final trial made with kale stalks. As peas cods once are plucked a chance to see, one though it was closely filled with three times three which when are cropped are safely home conveyed, and o'er the door the spell in secret laid. The latch moved up, 
when who should come in but his proper person, Lubakin. Candles, relics of the sacred fire, play an important part everywhere on Halloween. In England, too, the lighted candle and the apple were fastened to the stick, and as it whirled, each person in turn sprang up and tried to bite the apple. This was a rough game, more suited to Boris' frolic than the ghostly divinations that preceded it. Those with energy to spare found material to exercise it on. In an old book, there is a picture of a youth sitting on a stick placed across two stools. On one end of the stick is a lighted candle from which he is trying to light another in his hand. Beneath is a tub of water to receive him if he overbalances sideways. These games grew later into practical jokes. The use of a goblet may perhaps come from the story of the Luck of Edenhall. A glass stolen from the fairies and holding ruin for the house by whom it was stolen, if it should ever be broken. With ring and goblet this charm was tried. The ring, symbol of marriage, was suspended by a hair within a glass, and a name spelled out by beginning the alphabet over each time the ring struck the glass. When tired of activity and noise, the party gathered about a storyteller, or passed a bundle of sticks from hand to hand, each selecting one and reciting an instalment of the tale, till his stick burned to ashes. To induce prophetic dreams, the wooden water test was tried in England also. The Halloween is decidedly a country festival, in the 17th century, Young gentlemen in London chose a mask of the revels and held masks and dances with their friends on this night. In central and southern England, the ecclesiastical side of Hallowtide is stressed. Bread or cake has till recently been as much a part of Halloween preparations as plum pudding at Christmas. Probably this originated from an autumn baking of bread from the new grain. In Yorkshire, each person gets a triangular seed cake, and the evening is called cake night. Cakes appear also at the vigil of All Souls the next day. At a gathering, they lie in a heap for the guests to take. In return, they are supposed to say prayers for the dead. The poor in Staffordshire and Shropshire went about singing for soul cakes or money promising to pray and spend the alms in masses for the dead. The cakes were called soul mass or somas cakes. Soul, soul for a soul cake. Pray good mistress for a soul cake. One for Peter, two for Paul, three for them who made us all. In Dorsetshire, Halloween was celebrated by the ringing of bells in memory of the dead. King Henry VIII and later Queen Elizabeth issued commands against his practice. In Lancashire in the early 19th century, people used to go about begging for candles to drive away the gatherings of witches. If the lights were kept burning till midnight, no evil influence could remain near. In Derbyshire, central England, torches of straw were gathered about the stacks on All Souls' Eve not to drive away evil spirits as in Scotland, but to light souls through purgatory. Like the Bretons, the English have the superstition that the dead return on Halloween. Why do you wait at your door, woman, alone in the night? I am waiting for one who will come, stranger, to show him a light. He will see me afar on the road and be glad at the sight. Have you no fear in your heart, woman, to stand there alone? There is comfort for you and kindly content beside the hearthstone. She answered, No rest can I have till I welcome my own. It is far he must travel tonight, this man of your heart. Strange lands that I know not and pitiless seas has kept us apart. And he travels this night to his home without guide, without chart. 
And has he companions to cheer him? I am many, she said. The candles are lighted, the hearthstones are swept, the fires glow red. We shall welcome them out of the night, our home coming dead. From Halloween by Let's. Chapter 10 In Wales In Wales the custom of fires persisted from the time of the Druid festival days, longer than in any other place. First sacrifices were burned in them. Then instead of being burned to death, the creatures merely passed through the fire. And with the rise of Christianity, fire was thought to be a protection against the evil power of the same gods. Pontypridd in South Wales was the dread religious centre of Wales. It is still marked by a stone circle and an altar on a hill. In after years, it was believed that the stones were people changed to that form by the power of a witch. In North Wales, the November Eve fire, which each family built in the most prominent place near the house, was called Colcoth. Into the dying fire, each member of the family threw a white stone marked so that he could recognize it again. Circling about the fire, hand in hand, they said the prayers and went to bed. In the morning, each searched for his stone, and if he could not find it, he believed that he would die within the next twelve months. This is still credited. There is now the custom also of watching the fires till the last spark dies, and instantly rushing down the hill. The devil or the cutty black sow take the hindmost, a cardiganshire proverb says. A cutty black sow on every stile, spinning and carding every All Hallows' Eve. November Eve was called Noskal and Gef, the night of the winter calends. That is the night before the first day of winter. To the Welsh it was New Year's Eve. Welsh fairy tradition resembles that in the nearby countries. There is an old story of a man who lay down to sleep inside a fairy ring, a circle of greener grass where the fairies danced by night. The fairies carried him away and kept him seven years and after he had been rescued from them, he would neither eat nor speak. In the sea was the other world, a green fairy island reposing in sunlight and beauty on the ocean's calm breast. This was the abode of the druids, and hence of all supernatural beings, who were something betwixt heaven and hell, something that neither stood nor fell. As in other countries, the fairies or pixies are to be met at crossroads, where happenings such as funerals may be witnessed weeks before they really occur. At the Hello Eve supper, parsnips and cakes eaten, and nuts and apples roasted. A puzzling jug holds the ale. In the room are three holes that seem merely ornamental. They are connected with the bottom of the jug by pipes through the handle, and the unwitting toper is well drenched unless he is clever enough to see that he must stop up two of the holes and drink through the third. Spells are tried in Wales too with apples and nuts. There is ducking and snapping for apples. Nuts are thrown into the fire, denoting prosperity if they blaze brightly, misfortune if they pop or smolder and turn black. Fate is revealed by the three luckies in the ball of yarn thrown out of the window. Scotch and Irish charms. The leek takes the place of the cabbage in Scotland. Since King Cadwallo decorated his soldiers with leeks for their valour in a battle by a leek garden, they have been held in high esteem in Wales. A girl sticks a knife among leeks at Halloween and walks backward out of the garden. She returns later to find that her future husband has picked up the knife and thrown it into the centre of the leek bed.
taking two long-stemmed roses, the girl goes to her room in silence. She twines the stems together, naming one for her sweetheart and the other for herself, and thinking this rhyme. Twine, twine, and intertwine, let his love be wholly mine. If his heart be kind and true, deeper grow his roses hue. She can see, by watching closely, her lover's rose grow darker. The sacred ash figures in one charm. The party of young people seek an even leaved sprig of ash. The first who finds one calls out Sinova. If a boy calls out first, the first girl who finds another perfect shoot bears the name of the boy's future wife. Dancing and singing to the music of the harp close the evening. Instead of leaving stones in the fire to determine who are to die, people now go to church to see by the light of a candle held in the hand the spirits of those marked for death, or to hear the, the names called. The wind blowing over the feet of the corpses howls about the doors of those who will not be alive next Halloween. At the eve of All Souls Day, 24 hours after Halloween, children in eastern Wales go from house to house, singing for an apple or a pear, a plum or a cherry, or any good thing to make us merry. It is a time when charity is given freely to the poor. On this night and the next day, fires are burned, as in England to light souls to purgatory and prayers are made for a good wheat harvest next year by the Welsh, and keep the forms of religion very devoutly. And at the end of that chapter, I'm going to call it for tonight, and for Halloween for this year. As always, if you'd like to pick up where we've left off, you can find the original on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes are released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week, so make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Nights and Friends by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams.